just that and alert people to the associated health risk. Plus, digging in Tulsa's Greenwood District, why archaeologists are there and what they're looking for tonight on the Fox 25 News at 9. This is the Fox 25 News at 9. Thanks for watching Fox 25 tonight. I'm David Chazanoff. Today marks the first day of daylight saving time this year, and some Oklahoma lawmakers are working to lock the clock on daylight saving time. Fox 25's Katie Arata spoke to those lawmakers. So Katie, could this be the last time Oklahomans spring forward? Well, David, Senator Blake Cowboy Stevens, the author of Senate Bill 7, which would make daylight saving time year round, told me the Federal Sunshine Protection Act would have to pass through Congress first. We need Congress to pass the Sunshine Protection Act before we can actually enact this into law in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, realistically, we'll probably be looking at a year myself uh, after Congress passes this thing. Senate Bill 7 would lock the clock on daylight saving time, giving Oklahomans an extra hour of sunlight in the evenings. Uh, this is going to be a, a huge thing for agriculture. This is a huge driver uh, for our economy in tourism. It's going to be good for our uh, outdoor enthusiasts here in Oklahoma. That's our joggers, our bicyclists. Crime uh, actually goes down if we increase that hour in the evening. Oklahoma has spoken loudly. They want the clock to stop. Stephen says there are countless benefits to locking the clocks on daylight saving time, including some health benefits. It's any time and every time that we change the clock, uh, people uh, lose their lives. I mean, there's some people, there's a spike in heart attacks, strokes, and fatal car accidents. Doctors say that for the first two days after springing forward, heart attacks and strokes increased by 20%. Moving time uh, forward and backwards does appear to have effect on the presentation of cardiovascular negative events. Some argue to lock the clocks on standard time, but Senator Stevens thinks that is a bad idea. That really concerns me for, for a ton of reasons and um, because I see crime going up dramatically. I also see our economy getting, getting hammered um, in real serious ways. So um, along with our health and our mental health, uh, it would just be uh, very um, beneficial for the state of Oklahoma uh, to lock the clock on um, central daylight time. And Senate Bill 7 was passed in the Senate and now will head to the House to be heard. We will continue to follow it as it makes its way through the Capitol. Reporting live in studio, Katie Arata, Fox 25 News. Thank you, Katie, and good evening, everybody. We had uh, huge changes here across the state this weekend. Yesterday, we hit 80 degrees. Then last evening's cold front came through, and our high temperature dropped by 32 degrees. We were stuck in the 40s pretty much all day long. We only hit 48 degrees in Oklahoma City earlier this afternoon, and that's just about where we're sitting right now. 45 currently. Clear skies for the time being, but uh, we will, though, see the chance for a few more clouds to move in overnight. Tonight, overnight low is going to be pretty chilly. You're going to have to turn that heater on here this evening. Uh, temperature is going to be right around freezing, if not a few degrees below that, especially if you live north of I-40. So pretty cold night, and, and tomorrow, pretty similar story as well. Now, we will continue to stay dry, but once again, temperature is going to be stuck in the mid to upper 40s across northern and central Oklahoma, low 50s then across the far southern part of the state for the start of your work week on Monday, but not to worry. We're going to continue to just kind of ride this wave of the roller coaster of temperatures. We're going to be back into the 60s here just before you know it, but we do have a few more rain and possibly some snow chances to be talking about in your seven day forecast. So make sure you stay tuned. I'm going to be covering that for you in just a little bit. Thanks, Ross. One man is injured after a garage fire last night. Fire crews responded to a house fire in Northeast OKC near MLK and Northeast 21st Street. Arriving, they found a detached garage burning with one victim injured. That man was taken to the hospital while crews subdued the flames. Reports say the man think he, thinks he hit a fuel line while he was working on a car. And an update tonight on the deputy critically injured Friday night after crashing into a gate. The sheriff's office says Deputy Jeremy McCain's condition is improving and CT scan does not appear to show any serious brain damage. A GoFundMe for the deputy's medical expenses has started to circulate online. 
Also new tonight, Governor Kevin Stitt says a shipment of toxic waste from that train derailment in Ohio last month was going to be dumped right here in Oklahoma. The governor says he worked with our two senators and Congressman Frank Lucas to stop it late last night. According to the governor's office, about 4,000 tons of that waste was going to be dumped in our state. Groundbreaking archaeologists digging through Greenwood asking for the public's help. The Mapping Historical Trauma Project held its annual dinner tonight to share its findings and ask the community what it should do next. Sam Gelfan from our sister station in Tulsa spoke with the project's leaders about how profound their work can be. He reports on why archaeologists are interested in Black Wall Street. We tend to think that for archaeology to matter, it needs to look like the Great Pyramids or Machu Picchu or something like that. But Dr. Peter Van Valkenburg and Dr. Alicia Odawale had an epiphany. I never thought about the ways in which it could teach me about where I came from. The Greenwood District was home to the most successful black community in America. 100 years later, this is what's left. The artifacts can speak to how this community was built and how it was rebuilt and how it continues to survive against all odds. Like nails, light bulbs, and bricks sourced from other states used to rebuild after the Tulsa race massacre. And archaeology is powerful in that sense because when you see something and it stands underneath your feet and you look at it, it's there in a way that you can't deny. Archaeology is not just about objects, but about the people connected to these spaces. Which is why Van Valkenburg calls Odawale a pioneer of community-based archaeology. If archaeology is going to help solve problems or answer some lingering questions, we've got to know what those questions are. Archaeology done for archaeologists doesn't really help anybody. By involving the public in their research and asking everyday people what they should be studying, they're not just teaching others about Greenwood's history, they're learning about their own. We found out that I was a descendant of a survivor, and I didn't know that until we started this project. But they both agree there's plenty more digging to do. I think this will go on as long as it's needed, but it could go on for longer than my lifetime for sure. Props, costumes, and set pieces from an Emmy Award winning TV show you can bring to your own home. More than 300 items from HBO's Watchmen series are being auctioned off. What's being done with part of the proceeds guarantees to keep the show's tie to Tulsa's history alive. John Hayes from our sister station in Tulsa has more. There are so many custom props and custom wardrobe that that you just aren't going to find anywhere else. Jackson Strobel is talking about the more than 300 items up for a bid on the Heritage Auctions website right now from HBO's Watchmen series. It's an elaborate catalog ranging from Oklahoma posters and props to a car and even costumes worn by some familiar faces. We went with uh, what I call more of a rock and roll western look. That includes several worn by Tulsa native Tim Blake Nelson, who plays Looking Glass in the series. The auction's purpose, though, going much further than just hoping to bring in big bucks. The context of the show, um, you know, with the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre and everything that's going on there. And so this just sort of seemed like a perfect fit. That perfect fit, an effort requested by HBO, donating a portion of proceeds to Greenwood Rising here in Tulsa. It's a great opportunity for us to get the word out, not only about the museum, but about the history of Tulsa. Raymond Doswell says the museum isn't expecting a big cut, but considering the massacre's tie to the opening minutes of the show and its ripples throughout the season, this opportunity just makes sense. It makes us feel good that we play a small part in that by preserving the history, but the credit really goes to this community for fighting back and, and being stronger after such tragedy. And what better way to start a story than this image right here, right? The Friends of the Shelter Foundation spent the weekend outside the PetSmart and Norman supporting National Adoption Week. These four-legged friends lined up looking for a loving home to go to. Now the Friends of the Shelter Foundation say they are overrun with dogs needing adoption. All of the rescues across the state are overflowing right now. Um, so we need help. We need fosters to sign up. We provide everything, food, vet care, um, toys, treats, sweaters, you know, whatever the pet needs until they're adopted. It costs nothing to foster and you'll save lives. 
During the event, potential pet parents were given opportunities to spend time with the dogs in a big area. Now staff and volunteers help teach about caring for a pet and the types of tools, products, and services needed. And for all available pets for adoption, you can visit shelterfriends.org. Barkay and OKC is launching an exciting new regular event, Dog Breed Meetups. They say each meetup is a celebration of the diversity of the dog universe. Today's special breed, the French Bulldog. Frenchies are kind of our flat nosed friends. They look like little pigs and they're really fun. They're super cute. That brought their Frenchie got to enjoy half price drafts, and Barcade charges $10 to bring a dog plus $5 per additional pup. They must be on date on vaccination, trained to behave around other dogs, and at least be 12 months old. The Oklahoma Soul Food Festival happened today at the Labella Event Center in OKC. It may have been cold out today, but these people were out there staying warm with some comfort staples. Pork chops, oxtail, yams, greens, chicken, fish, and barbecue were all on the menu with over 30 different food vendors in attendance. Now other local small businesses were there too, selling jewelry, self-care items, and more. A disaster off the San Diego coast. Eight people are dead and seven others are missing after a smuggling boat overturned in the surf Saturday night. Search crews now call their efforts a recovery mission. Recovery mission. Thick smog frustrated crews overnight and another boat with eight people on board made it safely to shore. California is getting ready for another atmospheric river. As, as the state still deals with flooding and a levee breach from a storm earlier this week. The next one comes tomorrow and could throw an even bigger punch than the last one. Residents across the state are under flood warnings and advisories. President Joe Biden declared a federal emergency on Thursday. And a powerful wind, winter storm is expected to cover the Northeast in powder. Up to two inches of snow could fall every hour starting tomorrow night. Some areas will get Two feet by Tuesday, and the storm will affect much of New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Maine. A grim new report tonight from the Pentagon is painting a disturbing picture of the nation's military academies. According to the Defense Department, sexual assaults went up by 18% during the 2021-2022 school year. Along with the report, a student survey found increases in all types of, un of unwanted sexual contact from touching to rape at every military school. And we're now getting a look at the note left behind by the man who killed three students at Michigan State University last month. State police shared images of the note in his pocket, which you see on your screen right there. He claimed he was the leader of a 20 person group and listed other places members were going to target. Investigators, though, determined he acted alone and cleared those places. Our parent company, Sinclair Broadcast Group, is partnering with the National Alliance on Mental Illness to launch Sinclair Cares Mental Health so Support and Hope. It's a campaign to encourage mental health awareness with a focus on young adults. The campaign will run through the end of the month. You can open up your phone and scan this QR code you see on your screen for more mental health resources. You can also go to our website, okcfox.com, to learn more. And welcome back. Former Vice President Mike Pence doesn't hold back, criticizing his former boss for the January 6th Capitol riot. Pence saying, quote, Trump was wrong in remarks at the gridiron dinner attended by politicians and journalists. He says Trump had no right to overturn the election, adding that Trump's reckless words endangered his family and everyone at the Capitol that day. First Lady Jill Biden visited a medical center in New Orleans to explain the importance of cancer research. Together with Republican Senator Bill Cassidy, the First Lady toured the, the Louisiana Cancer Research Center. It comes after President Joe Biden proposed a budget with $2.8 billion allocated to fight the deadly disease. Cancer doesn't care who someone votes for. It isn't a red issue or a blue issue. It's a human issue. And it takes all of us working together and sharing ideas to stop it. While Senator Cassidy criticized the president's overall budget plan, he talked about the need for early detection and treatments for colorectal cancer. 
The House Freedom Caucus rolls out their demands ahead of a debt limit ceiling fight. It doesn't touch Social Security or Medicare, though. The plan includes capping discretionary spending at fiscal year 22 levels for a decade, keeping defense spending at current levels, ending the student loan forgiveness plan, and more. Folks, we've got a serious proposal. We urge our colleagues on the Republican side and the Democrat side to come along. If you don't like what we've offered, God bless you, that's fine. What have you got to offer? And here is the kicker. For all the talks of deficit reduction and fiscal responsibility, this would reduce the deficit by zero dollars. The president's budget proposal includes tax hikes on the wealthy to cover more spending. He says he wants the debt limit increased without cuts or preconditions. And President Biden says he will block or limit oil drilling in 16 million acres in Alaska and the Arctic Ocean. The plan blocks drilling in 3 million acres of ocean and closes it off the rest of its federal waters from oil exploration. It also creates new rules for 13 million acres of land in the National Petroleum Reserve. And West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin tanks President Biden's nominee to oversee oil and gas leasing at the Interior Department. The moderate Democrat leads the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, carrying great influence over the closely divided chamber. Manchin says this hurts the nation's energy security, and he won't support anyone who plays, quote, partisan politics. And polls show Americans support tighter, tighter rules on the railroad industry. Whether or not to tighten, though, is causing tension among Republicans. Senator J.D. Vance put many of his fellow Republicans on notice during a Senate hearing about the Ohio derailment. And these comments are not directed at them. Who they are directed at is a particular slice of people who seem to think that any public safety enhancements for the rail industry is somehow a violation of the free market. Now, Vance joined a handful of bipartisan groups in proposing new rules on faulty ball bearings, which is suspected to have caused last month's derailment. Some in his party are taking a wait and see approach. I'm never in favor much of more federal government, the federal government telling the states how to do their business. Uh, but we've got to wait for the full investigative report from the National Transportation Safety Board, find out why this uh, accident occurred. And this was the first major hearing since that derailment. Three women from Texas are missing in Mexico after they crossed the border last month to, to sell clothes at a flea market. Family members say they have not heard from these women you see on your screen since February 24th. The three were traveling to Nuevo Leon, which is about a three hour drive from McAllen, Texas. And meanwhile, Mexican authorities confirmed the arrests of five additional suspects in, in the kidnapping and deaths of Americans in Matamoros. The Gulf cartel shared a letter apologizing for the attack, saying it would hand over the members involved. The U.S. ambassador to Mexico calls this a significant operation. From the minute that I got the call that we had four missing Americans, is that our job was to do everything we could to find them and to hopefully find them alive. And that's what I asked the Mexican government to do. They cooperated in every way uh, that they could. Ambassador Salazar also addressed recent comments by the Mexican president downplaying his country's role in the fentanyl crisis. He reminded him of talks with the U.S. and Canada when they agreed it was the highest priority health and security issue for our people. And at least one person died and several others injured in Afghanistan yesterday after a bomb exploded at an award ceremony for journalists. Officials say the blast killed a security guard and wounded five journalists and three children. The United Nations mission in, the, in Afghanistan condemned the attack on Twitter, calling it despicable. Italy's Coast Guard are finishing a mission to rescue hundreds of migrants off the country's southern coast. Officials identified three vessels drifting in the Mediterranean Sea, each one overcrowded with hundreds of people. Together with the country's Navy, the Coast Guard took roughly 1,800 people to shore. And Prince Edward has received the Duke of Edinburgh title from his brother King Charles III. 
Buckingham Palace officials say Prince Edward received the title for his 59th birthday and will hold it for the rest of his life. Prince Edward is the youngest child of the late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, the former Duke of Edinburgh. In America, we all love our pets. During the COVID shutdowns, it seemed more people loved them than ever, but that comes with a hard reality. Across the country today, there are more sick animals than vets to care for them. Cheryl Atkinson has been looking into the problem. These two puppies got a home with Deborah Forbes and her husband in June of last year. A few weeks later, Tanner, on the left, started crying and didn't want to be touched. The regular family emergency vet turned him away. It wasn't like their parking lot had 40 cars in it. It just was looked like a normal day and they just weren't taking clients anymore. Um, so then we had to go to the other one that I was not familiar with and they were very short staffed as well. And I think because they were short staffed, I think, you know, they did an x-ray. Okay. He didn't break anything. He's fine. Send him on his way. But Tanner wasn't fine. His legs became paralyzed and he started bleeding profusely from a cut near his mouth. It took weeks to get an appointment with a specialist and even longer to finally get an accurate diagnosis from his regular vet. By then, we had no choice but to put him down because he was going to show up staff if we didn't. So sorry. Across the country, animal owners are getting turned away by short staffed veterinary offices and emergency clinics. Patients are frequently sent hours away to neighboring states to look for care, but still coming up empty. So this is where we would perform procedures. Most Kayleen Glore is co-medical director of Clarendon Animal Care in Arlington, Virginia, where 14 doctors have seen thousands of pets and started finding it more and more difficult to get critically sick animals into emergency hospitals. So in this area, we've got, we're lucky, we've got a lot of 24-hour emergency referral hospitals, and I would say it's not uncommon for us to call three to four of them to find out where we can get a patient transferred. Is that new compared to five years ago? Absolutely. On the supply side, the veterinary industry already had a high turnover rate. Each year, one in six vets and one in four technicians leaves their job, and veterinarians commit suicide at a greater than average rate. During the pandemic, many say they faced bullying and abuse from customers frustrated by everything from cost of care to COVID measures. Is there a thought that if they had caught it, you know, been able to treat it when you caught it or when it was finally caught, that there could have been a different outcome? I think that early on, if we could have known this and gotten not detected and had someone who knew what they were talking about, but there's definitely a possibility that something more could have been done for him. Some states are getting creative. A proposal in California would give up to $150,000 in student debt relief to licensed vets in exchange for working at a California animal shelter for at least five years. For Full Measure, I'm Cheryl Atkinson. Breakthrough technology could help those struggling with hair loss. Medical reporter Liz Bonus explains how this all works. Hey there, hello to you. This new technology, a robot that can help simplify hair transplants to help beat baldness. The befores and afters can be pretty dramatic from a hair transplant. Mark Lucas said when he had his years ago. They basically cut me from ear to ear in the back of my head. But now, rather than having to take a strip of that hair and move it from the back of the head to the top or wherever else you want it to grow, the robot changes all that. Dr. John Mendelson of the Advanced Cosmetic Surgery and Laser Center says the robot is programmed to find and select tiny pieces of the skin known as grafts with healthy hair. It removes them and then allows them to be placed where you want the hair to grow. And right behind me here, you can see the artist robot is with more precision and uh, it, more adeptness. It's, it can harvest 2000 grafts per hour. So you're seeing our technicians clean the grafts as they're being harvested. And what the harvest means is we're gonna borrow donor hair from the back so that we can place it where we want in the recipient area. That means a process that would usually take hours by hand is significantly shortened. But by allowing the robot to assist us, it allows our technicians to 
more precisely spend their time placing the hair. All this new technology recently led Mark Lucas to have a follow-up transplant. But I still had some areas. I still had some areas up here that uh, were a little thin. Mark mostly wants to cover up some of the back scars and improve what's on the top of his head. The new hairs are just now kind of starting to grow. It's been four months. It takes about four months for the new hairs to start uh, growing. And, and I can feel, I can feel thickness all through here that I didn't have before. These transplants can range in cost from about five to $20,000, most of the time not covered by your medical insurance plans. I'm medical reporter Liz Bonus. Now back to you. Economic advisors are offering an optimistic outlook after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. It's the second biggest bank failure in history. Depositors rushed to withdraw their money this week over concerns the bank couldn't pay up. And the FDIC shuttered the bank before noon. Still, advisors say they have full faith in regulators. We are in a fundamentally different position uh, that, that, you know, with the reforms of the global financial uh, crisis of 2007-2008, uh, we've put in place stress tests and other tools that our regulators have uh, to provide more resilience to our banking system. Trading of the bank shares had to be stopped before the opening bell due to the extreme volatility. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen tells reporters the federal government will not bail out the collapsed Silicon Valley Bank. Well, let me be clear that um, during the financial crisis, um, there were um, investors um, and owners of systemic large banks that were bailed out and we're certainly not looking and uh, the reforms that have been put in place means that we're not going to do that again. Yellen says the U.S. banking system is safe despite fears of a domino effect. She adds the government is working to help depositors who are worried about their money. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation insures deposits up to $250,000, and many SVP customers had more than that in their bank accounts. Secretary Yellen downplays a possible domino effect on the banks, but it's on a lot of people's minds. Senator Mark Warner is on the Senate Banking Committee. He tells reporters this week the risk, it's real. If other regional banks, mid-sized banks, if people get nervous, they may start taking their money out of those banks and putting it into the large money center banks. We don't want further consolidation. Warner hopes a larger bank acquires SB SVB to ensure reimbursement of savings and investments above the $250,000 insured limit. But the government is working to calm fears before the markets open Sunday night in Asia and tomorrow morning in the U.S. Yellen says supervision and regulation are the antidote for, quote, contagion in the banking industry. And the Federal Reserve is holding an emergency closed doors meeting tomorrow after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. The Fed is in a tough spot. It remains aggressive in its rate hikes to curb stubborn inflation. But those rate increases also played a role in SVB's collapse. The markets are also taking a beating as investors wait anxiously to see what's next. And developing now, the U.S. government says clients of the collapsed bank and newly shuttered Signature Bank will have, ac will have access rather to all their funds tomorrow. The U.S. Treasury, Federal Reserve, and FDIC announcing emergency steps to, re to prevent a potential domino effect after last week's run on SVB. Their plan will allow banks to take loans from the government. They say there will, no there will be no bailouts and taxpayers won't foot the bill. Ford issues a small recall of its popular F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck. 18 of those cars have a possible battery defect that can cause it to catch fire. That's according to the CNBC. It's an apparent assembly problem. Trucks that haven't rolled off the line yet are being reviewed. It's about that time of the night. Fox 25 meteorologist Ross Muma has your back with tonight's forecast. So, Ross, on Saturday it was so nice. Sunday, kind of cold. What's up with that? <laughs> what's, what's going on for the upcoming week? Hey, good evening, David. Yeah, I know. Uh, we kind of got a little bit of everything here, not just this weekend, but really over the coming week. This is really, you know, kind of the 
typical early spring setup. You get a couple really warm days and then also a couple very chilly days and that's kind of where we're at right now. Today we were stuck in the upper 40s. It's going to be a very similar story tomorrow as well. Temperatures going to start out in the mid 30s by about 9 10 a.m. Mostly cloudy skies through the morning. Partly cloudy by the afternoon, but once again, temperatures going to be stuck in the mid to upper 40s by about 3 to 4 o'clock. So expect another pretty chilly day for your Monday. On Tuesday morning, also going to be a very cold start with the chance for not only some scattered showers, but also a little bit of a rain and snow mix, mainly across far western and southwestern Oklahoma, as a very small system makes its way here across the western and central parts of the state. So here's about 6, 7 a.m. You're going to start to see some of those blues, those pinks popping up really anywhere from Woodward down through Elk City, Clinton, Hobart, and even really the north side or northwest side of Comanche County down near the Lawton area. So temperatures going to be really one or two degrees above freezing or possibly below. So right around that freezing point could produce some of that wet snow and um, possibly some freezing rain in there as well. But as you go throughout the rest of the morning, temperatures slowly going to start to warm up. So by lunchtime, upper 30s, lower 40s. No snow is going to be possible there. So we will begin to see some scattered showers coming in across the I-35 corridor. But by the afternoon, I'd say 3 o'clock at the latest, pretty much all this is going to be out of here. So we will have a drier afternoon there for uh, your Tuesday. Temperatures should, though, begin to warm up even further than mid 50s by Tuesday afternoon. And then we see a huge warm up on Wednesday. Thanks to very strong southerly winds, gusts upwards of 30 to 40 miles per hour. That's going to nudge those temperatures into the upper 60s once again. So warm, windy, mostly sunny skies for your Wednesday will remain fairly warm through the first half of your Thursday as well. But then Thursday late afternoon and into the evening, we're going to see a very strong cold front move through the state, not only bringing us uh, another pretty significant cool down, but also some uh, scattered showers, maybe even a few isolated thunderstorms, mainly across central and the eastern part of the state. So uh, the latter half of your Thursday likely going to be a rainy one. And then we're looking much colder for St. Patrick's Day on Friday. Temperatures back into the upper 40s yet again. Pretty windy out there as well, so not necessarily the, the greatest day to maybe, you know, go have a green beard, you know, outside of McNelly's or out on a patio somewhere. So definitely a, a chilly end to the week, and that trend's going to continue into the weekend. We're sticking with the upper 40s with possibly another chance for a rain and snow mix by the end of next weekend. Thanks, Ross. Love that leprechaun by you, by the way. Uh, Fox 25 is partnering with Science Museum Oklahoma for the return of Storm Safety Day. Make sure you mark your calendars to join us March 25th at the museum from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can learn the science behind the storm and take part in exciting experiments. And the first 500 guests, guests will get $5 off admission to the, to the museum courtesy of Kroger Delivery. Bring the whole family on March 25th. School lunch debt, something families across the country struggle with. It keeps piling up, leaving kids eating alternative lunches. Our sister station in Cincinnati reports on how one student is doing something pretty magical to end what they call food shaming. Tara McGrath says her ninth grade daughter Carly came home one day upset with the fact that some of her classmates weren't receiving the same amount to eat as others in her school in the Little Miami School District. So she and her friends organized a fundraiser called Little Princess Tea Time with high schoolers dressing up as Disney characters to serve 112 younger kids pizza, tea, apple juice, and help them make magic wands and tiaras. McGrath provided these videos and photos of the February 25th event, which raised about $4,000, catching all those students up on their debt. Uh, very proud of her, proud of her and all of her friends um, for taking the time out of their very busy active schedule that they have. They all are great students and very active in sports. Overall, some estimates have school lunch debt at $26 million nationally and climbing. The issue began last fall when districts started charging for lunches again after the pandemic benefits expired. Growing debt is forcing some systems to serve kids who haven't paid so-called alternative lunches, many times a cheese sandwich and a piece of fruit. It's a practice some call food shaming. That debt reached nearly $10,000 at the King's local district, which had district leaders also considering alternative lunches. Our previous story sparked parent Carrie Arnsmeyer to launch a GoFundMe page, which has raised more than $8,000 so far. She's keeping it open because there will be more debt accrued through the rest of the school year.
that's really what we wanted to avoid is any kid having to go to the cafeteria and feel like they were being singled out or, you know, kids are really impressionable. Hey, the brackets are out. Coming up at 10 on Fox 25 Sports Sunday, we're going to talk some college basketball. The NCAA tournament brackets are out for both the men's and women's tournament. NIT as well. What's up with OSU and OU on that front? Thunder won action tonight. Second of a back-to-back. They're still in the hunt for the play-in spot. Playoffs too. Several state champions crowned in high school basketball. The state tournament action winding up last night. We'll definitely get into that as well. Plus, we've got some football, pro football, NFL free agents beginning this week college as well. That and more coming up at 10 o'clock, which is about 17 minutes, well, 16 minutes and 8 seconds to be exact. That's on Fox 25 Sports Sunday coming up top of the hour. We'll be right back. And welcome back. The Oklahoma City Zoo sharing this video of their grizzly bear playing in the water after a winter of hibernation. They say it can only mean one thing, that spring is here. The zoo is offering extended hours until Sunday, March 19th, accommodating families looking for fun over spring break. They're open from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. And four astronauts are back on the ground for the first time in five months. The international crew splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico late Saturday night after 157 days aboard the International Space Station. While on board, they conducted experiments and technology demonstrations to prepare for future deep space missions and return missions to the moon. Five months not on Earth. Don't know if I could do that. Oh, my goodness, me either. <laughs> All right, let's get you one last look here at your forecast. Another chilly day in store tomorrow. Temperatures stuck in the 40s, back to the mid 50s for Tuesday with a chance for a rain and snow mix across western Oklahoma Tuesday morning. Very warm middle part of the week, back into the upper 60s with the next big storm system coming in on Thursday. Then we're back to the 40s yet again for St. Patrick's Day and the rest of next weekend. Curtis? Hey, Ross, real quick, uh, what's the temperature in Stillwater right now? Uh, you had to guess. Give me a ballpark. 45. It's colder than that, actually, because OSU is not happy right now. They didn't get into the NCAA tournament. I know that was bad. I tried. I like it. Um, listen, Cowboys are not happy. We're going to talk a lot about that coming up on Fox 25 Sports Sunday and what the Cowboys learned about their NCAA fate today in sports next.